welcome to the St. Peter Institute uh, podcast. And uh, I have here with me my guest, uh, Luke Lancaster, who is the Director of Biblical Apologetics for the St. Peter Institute. Uh, Luke, welcome and uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Marcus. It's great to see you again. Likewise, it's great to see you too. Yeah. So uh, we decided to make this our first podcast and we, we'd like to talk about the Catholic teaching against the Protestant teaching of one saved, always saved. So uh, I'd like to launch right into that and just start picking your brains on it immediately, Luke. So tell us, what is eternal security? Well, eternal security is where, like, you know, we all believe that, you know, Christians in general will typically believe that Jesus came and he restored the relationship between God and man. So that they were separated and then jesus fills the gap he restores he reconciles brings them together the difference though is that catholics will say that that's kind of like a relationship now like god and man are restored they're, they have a relationship but that relationship could get broken again protestants some of them at least will say that that relationship has been sealed like jesus restored it the first time and it's a done deal like Everything you do in the future has been forgiven. Like Jesus' death like forgives past sins, present sins, and future sins. So there's nothing that you can do to stop this relationship. It's a relationship like no other. Um, I'd say that's the, that's the key distinction there. It's basically like, can a Christian go to hell? Um, you know, typically, Protestants will say that Christians can't go to hell. Um, not all of them will say that, but some will. They'll believe in this idea of eternal security. Um, and that's just problematic for us because we see like, scripture not speaking like that. There's like various examples in scripture of uh, that not being the case. Like you know, I could launch into them now if you want. Um, yeah. I, got, I mean, before we launch into the scripture, just, uh, yeah. I, I just want to ask you to expand a little more on some of the moral ramifications of this doctrine. So uh, the, the the secular name for this doctrine is one saved, always saved. The the basic principle is that once a person embraces Jesus Christ, no matter what they do, they're never leaving. They're they're never losing their salvation. So, uh, would you take us through some of the moral problems that this presents, uh, if there are any at all? Yeah, it's a, a moral problem. Could be people can start to form this kind of easy believism, like. Uh, I believe in Christ and I've been saved and they're not going to be intensely focused on preserving that relationship and maintaining that relationship with God. Um, I think that's something that, you know, not every, you know, not every person is going to fall into that mistake, but a lot will. Um, if we look at Catholics, we think of uh, some of the amazing saints that we've had. Um, they all took it so seriously, like the threat of, they're dealing with God, and that dealing with God is a beautiful thing and wonderful, and he is intensely loving and forgiving, but he's also God. He's also somebody that you can, like, really screw up. Like, he asks you to do certain things, and if you don't, you know, show your to him, if you don't show that you're a beloved child of him and live that out the way that he asks you to and he commands you to, well, he's a father that loves us and tells us how to live, if you don't do that there's some pretty serious ramifications for that you know, like hell is a possibility and i think that that's what drove a lot of the saints to their sainthood that the that understanding of i love god and i want to serve him totally and completely and i also don't want to go to hell uh, so if you if you don't believe that that's a possibility then i don't think it's going to drive you as intensely i'm not going to say that everybody's going to do that but that, that can be a, a real problem there Oh, and I agree with you. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's so great that you bring that up. St. Thomas Aquinas writes uh, in his Summa that there really are two kinds of fear that drive the Christian life. You've got, uh, on, on the one hand, a kind of servile fear, this, this fear of hell. On the other hand, there's this filial fear, this fear of offending this father whom you love so much. So that, that's exactly what you're talking about here. So yeah, let's... Uh, Let's launch right into the, the scriptural basis of this. So where are Protestants getting this one saved, always saved doctrine? 
and what does the church really, or what does scripture really teach about the one saved, always saved doctrine? Yeah, so Protestants will look to various um, texts in scripture. They've they formed an understanding of like, um, you know, we think of John three sixteen for example, is like God so loved the world, he gave his only son, those who believe in him might not die, but have eternal life. They think that you have eternal life and that that is an eternal gift, like it can't be revoked. They see that as a gift, period, and that it's not a gift that you can destroy or get rid of. It's, you know, you have to have faith, and if you believe in God, then it's faith alone, and you're, you're good at that. Point. Um, there's um, all kind of can think of that they would try to use, um, for example, being like in the palm of the hand of Jesus or being in the palm of the Father in, in John chapter 10. Um, the C text says God, when God speaks of being loving and caring and protecting or um, that like nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, that these like really moving passages about God loving and caring for us imply that like we don't seem to have free will and can reject that, that love and that care that we can actually like say like, you know what, like I love you. I thank you for your care and protection, but I'm good. I don't want that anymore. <laughs> you know, or you can't say like, I'm going to reject that. Like grace is a gift, but it's it's not like irresistible. Right, right. Yeah, uh, but yeah and, and you know, on the one hand, it's this cheapening of grace that many of the saints have written on before. It's this bad understanding that, you know, grace is there and no matter what I do, I'm always going to be worthy of it. Well, in, in one sense, that's never going to be true because grace is unmerited favor. On the other hand, despite the fact that it's unmerited, God's pouring it out abundantly. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's dive right into the Catholic position on this. Let's, let's look into scripture and, and see what does the Catholic church really teach on one saved, always saved? And, and why is it crucial for us to embrace the Catholic notion of it? Yeah. So when we look at the gospels and we look at Paul's letters and we think you know, there's a lot of things in there about sin. God is, you know, constantly urging us to love him and to not offend him, to not disobey him as well, a loving child. If you're supposed to listen to your father and follow, because he only wants what's best for you. Um, so you have to be following and obeying him. And there's there's a distinction there seems to be in scripture where um, certain things Jesus is very intense on and certain things he's like you know, still intense on, but not as intense. I was like, in all of our human actions, like I could, I don't know, get angry at somebody for buying the wrong kind of milk for me, or I could get so angry that I punch them in the face. Like there's, a, there's two different kinds of actions there. One is like bad, but then another one is like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, that like really would make the other person want to avoid me. You know, uh, that really kind of shatters that relationship you got going on there. So one, one verse in particular that I, I always seem to think about is, um, is Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. Um, in that, Jesus, he points to his relationship with man. And he says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, whoever denies me before men, I'm going to deny before my Father. It's like, well, think about that. What does that mean exactly? Like, you know, if I have a friend, um, you know, if somebody says, hey, is this your friend? <laughs> you know, or um, like, are, are you going to be around them a lot and loving them and not, you know, treating them badly? Like, are you going to acknowledge them as your friend? Are you going to you know, keep associating yourself with them? Are you going to keep loving them and keep, you know, helping them and helping each other? You know, it's a, it's a friendship going on there. Uh, if you're acknowledging them as your friend and being with them, Jesus is saying, like, if you do that with him, just as a normal friend is given a friendship analogy, it just, if you do that with him, you know, when you die and you go to be judged by God, Jesus is going to be like, I like that. Like, I know that guy. He's my friend. You know, I acknowledge him. He acknowledged me before others. I acknowledge him before you, God. Um, but then he does the flip side and reverses it and says, whoever denies me before I also will deny before my father who is in heaven it's like if I deny Christ 
Yeah, I can think of two particular examples of this in scripture. I would say Judas and Peter particularly did that. Um, where they said, no, I don't know the man. Like, no, I'm not friends with him. Or, you know what, I, I used to be, but not, not anymore. In the case of Judas, that's kind of like what he's doing. Like, I, you know, I used to follow him, but not anymore. Uh, like, I like money better. Or, uh, denying him, saying that you don't know the man. If you do that, Jesus is not going to be wishy-washy with you and say, like, that's okay. You know, like, we're, we're still friends. Like, no, like, if you just said we're not friends, then we're not friends. So when you die and you go before God, if you denied people, if you denied Jesus before other people, Jesus is going to say, I deny you as well. Like, no, Father God, I don't know this guy. And so where do you go at that point? Like, if Jesus isn't on your side, then I mean, Jesus is the reason we go to heaven. So if he's not on our side, then I'd say that's pretty frightening. I'd say that'd be implying you go to hell. Um, and this idea is kind of shown as well with um, in Second Timothy. Um, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, if we deny him, that is Jesus, he's talking about Jesus here. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Like that's, that's the same idea that Jesus had said. If you deny me, I'm going to deny you. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward friendship there of uh, you can't say I don't know the guy. So let's look at uh, let's look at Judas a little more. Some people try to say that Judas like really wasn't a Christian to begin with. But in reality, that really is <laughs> that really is not the case. Uh, Judas was definitely a Christian and he was a follower. He was a friend. He's one of the closest people to Jesus. He was. 12, 12 people of all the followers of Jesus, 12 of them were his closest. They were, they were his disciples. And Judas was one of those 12. He was chosen by God. He was chosen by Christ. Uh, Mark chapter 6, and he talks about you know, listing out these disciples that he's chosen. And he sends all of those disciples, all 12 of them, two by two out, giving them authority to cast out unclean spirits. Um, they all start re like preaching repentance and healing the sick with oil. That, that doesn't sound like a fake Christian. That sounds like, okay, like this is a legit guy who's like chosen by God and he's doing what God wants. But then after doing that for some time, he doesn't like, he's like all of us, you know, we all make mistakes, but certain mistakes are worse than others. Certain mistakes, there's a different category for them. And what Jesus did at the night of the Last Supper, he goes to the, the chief priests who are trying to kill Jesus. Now, can you imagine like following this guy, you know, me and Joe over here are friends, but those people over there in the government or something, or those people at that group over there, they want to, they want to kill him. Would you like go to those people and say, Hey, like, I don't really know that. I don't really know Joe. You know, like, what would you give me if I gave him to you? Like, that would be a pretty serious denial. Um, Judas goes to the uh, Jewish leaders and, Ask them, you know, yeah, what would you guys give me if I gave you Jesus and 30 pieces of silver? Um, so that night, you know, the Last Supper, Judas and Jesus are, you know, they're all there having that last meal. And Jesus says to him point blank, um, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. This is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 no i'm sorry john chapter 13 verse 18 my bad um like they're all eating this meal but he's looking at judas here saying he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me like that's a, that's actually a direct quotation from psalm 41 verse 9 which says even my bosom friend in whom i trusted who ate of my bread has lifted his heel against me like he's basically very clearly said like you are my friend but you're listing your heel against me. Like right after he does this, right after they eat this meal, Judas leaves and goes to the high priest. And, you know, Judas ends up handing him over to the high priest. Like they all go to the garden of Gethsemane and Judas points out who Jesus is and they take him into custody and they kill him. Like you just denied your bosom friend, according to Jesus. You just lifted his heel against me. That's like 
it's not just some minor action. That was a very serious action. It wasn't just a little lifting of his heel, like totally lifted your heel and you totally squashed him in the face. You totally rejected him. Um, so that would be an example of a mortal sin, I would say. What do you think about that, Marcus? Well, I actually think that's very, uh, that's very jarring. It's a very vivid uh, description of, of how one so close to Christ can lose their salvation. I can't help but uh, think about when Jesus is depicting the, the particular judgment and uh, you've, you've got this whole group of people coming over to Christ saying, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? And he turns back at them and says, be gone from me, you evil people. I never knew you. Not, uh, I don't know you. Not, you have rejected me. I never knew you. Uh, it, 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 it's a very startling realization because I, I'm just following everything you're saying here. I'm looking at Matthew 10 and, and Matthew 10, 33, Christ says, whoever denies me for men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. So what I'm gaining from you right now is it's clear that there's going to be a kind of time of judgment before the father who is in heaven, where Jesus could very genuinely either acknowledge or deny us based on the way we've lived on earth, despite the fact that we have known and loved him in the past. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's terrible. We also need to keep in mind that like, Judas had the ability of repenting. You know, all of us, if we have committed a very serious sin, like it's, if we denied Christ at some point, we can like repent. And I think that's the, the case with Peter. I think that's why uh, it's so beautiful to have Jesus had 12 disciples and two of them particularly struggled with that. You know, Judas denied Christ. Peter also denied Christ. You know, we think about uh, Peter being one of the 12. He was always listed first whenever describing uh, the list of the 12. It's always Peter. You know, he's the top one there. He's always the guy with the loud mouth and always speaking first and you know, Peter's the one who proclaims that Jesus is the Christ you know, of all of them. Like he kind of speaks for them as like the representative of the 12 and Jesus offers him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He says the, the rock of the church. Um, but Peter in a moment of fear, like same night that Judas had betrayed him that same night, Jesus is taken into custody and he's going to die. And Peter goes over there to the, Peter goes over to the house of the high priest and he sits outside you know, a group of people there and they have a fire going on. And like we've all been different bonfires, you know how you sit around a bonfire and you're just relaxing out there. Well, this one was probably kind of tense because you know, there's something serious going on inside the, the house of the high priest. Like he's really like examining this guy to sentence him to death. Um, I want to charge him with blasphemy. And so, like, if you're imagining yourself, like, sitting there at a bonfire, you don't want to be, like, associated with that guy who is going to go to, <laughs> going to go to prison. He's going to, not going to go to prison, actually. He's going to die. You know, like, you imagine the, being associated with uh, some criminal who was going to receive capital punishment. Like, you'd be, uh, you'd be connected with that as well, possibly. You like, you don't want to associate yourself in that camp. So, Peter's in that camp. And people recognize that when they're sitting there and so they're like the aren't you that guy like aren't you one of those you're one of his disciples aren't you like you're a follower of jesus um, and in a moment of weakness and a moment of fear uh, i would say pretty intense fear like i don't want to be associated with him he's like no i don't know that guy like no i'm not following that guy and you know what happens after he does that it says in luke chapter 22 verse 61 Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Talk about profound. Like, oh my gosh. Like, Peter, like, he doesn't just deny him once, like, on three separate occasions while he's sitting out there. It's not like he denied him once, but then thought about it. It's like, ooh, you know what? I shouldn't have said that. Actually, I'm, you know, I was just afraid when I said, like, I do, I am a follower. Or he didn't, like, get up and leave and think, oh, darn it, I shouldn't have done that. Or, like it happened over and over and over again. Like he had three separate occasions to acknowledge that Jesus was, you know, his master, that he was a disciple of him. And he denied it all three times. 
And then Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Like, can you imagine like being somebody's friend and then you looking at them and they're like just denied you three times or like sitting outside around a bonfire and your friend just says like, no, I don't know that guy. No, I don't know that guy. Like, he's your best friend or one of your best friends or you hang out for the last three years together, always doing stuff, traveling around the world, eating together, sleeping together. Sleep in the same area, living together, like, and now like no, you don't know him. That's really serious. At that yeah. point, I'd say that that really fulfills what Jesus said about if you deny me, I'm going to deny you. I think Jesus real. I think Peter realized that and he repented. Like he, he just started sobbing deeply, and he ends up repenting. Like later on, um, when the Jesus has died and then resurrected from the dead, uh, and he's out, out fish, or he's out on the sea and uh, or out on the beach, and Peter comes in from the shore and like, he, he goes to him, and, like he's probably deeply sorrowful at that point. When Jesus just immediately asks him, "Do you love me?" You know, like I mean, if, if somebody, if my friend had just denied me three times, I'd ask him as well. I look him point blank, like, "Do you love me?" Like, are you? Do you take back what you said? And Peter's like, Lord, you know that I love you. And they just like reaffirms like, feed my sheep. You know, or we're still in this. You still got the keys. You're still going to be a shepherd. You're still going to keep serving. Um, you do love me. You haven't, uh, I, I forgive you of that sin. Like, I'm not going to deny you before my father. You have like genuinely said like, yes, I do love you. And that's just such a such a forgiving thing on the part of God that just realize that he's not somebody that's going to be intensely judgmental, but somebody who's so willing to forgive at any moment, the second that you apologize, the second that you repent. That's the same way that we sometimes we act. So, so we're not always like that. We're not always repenting quickly. We're not always apologizing pre, like all the time like we should. Um, but that does happen where somebody apologizes and they forgive and, you know, the wrong is okay. So I think that Judas and Peter in particular are, are two particular aspects of committing a mortal sin. And it would be, a, it is also, we also have to keep in mind, this is up to God. You know, so we have that idea of like the standard is you deny me, I'll deny you. Um, but the church also like has an understanding of psychological circumstances. If you're deep in habit with something or, uh, I uh, had some kind of psychological illness or you know, like, oh, there's different surrounding circumstances to every action. So God takes that into account. He understands our weaknesses. So uh, we ultimately always have to say like, it's up to God, you know, about making that decision, but we always have to preach. Like Jesus said, if you deny me, he's going to deny you. So that's a pretty frightful place to be in. Right. Right. It is. It is. And, and yeah, I, I hear you. One of the beautiful things about the church's uh, exercise of God's mercy is this account that uh, habitual sin, psychological disposition, uh, if a person is not in the best uh, mental state at the time, then culpability for that sin is diminished, uh, sometimes even greatly. But uh, I, I'd like to just explore this notion as a doctrine a little further. Uh, there are some who posit that once you receive your salvation, you never lose it. And so for those people who wind up losing it or who wind up falling into despair, like say Judas, their argument would be that he was never Christian to begin with and he never had that faith and therefore he was never saved to begin with. What would a good answer be to those assertions? I think like you can understand like where they're coming from there of like, you know, he, Satan did enter into him and he, he can be de demonstrated to have greed issues all throughout the schools, you know, where he's uh, the, the woman who breaks open that jar of oil and uses her hair to clean the feet of Jesus. Like that was a year's worth of wages, Judas points out. And he wanted, you know, he wanted that. Want to take that money? I think money should have been given to the poor, but it, like it says in John's Gospel, like on a side note, you know. But he really just only wanted to 
you know, st- steal that money. Like he was going to handle the money bag and he was going to steal that money. So he, he was definitely very attached to greed. So you can see where people might say like, well, maybe he was just like, never really was a Christian to begin with. You know, like he was just kind of going along with it. Um, but I don't see how you can actually say that, particularly when I, I quoted that passage um, where Jesus like specifically says to him, he who ate my bread, like that's, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Like that's a quote from the Psalm. He's not going to take something out of context. Jesus isn't going to just throw words around and hope that it like hits the dartboard of something that happened in the Old Testament. Like he always takes the Old Testament into account. Yeah. It's like, we're going to quote something. Like what is the context there? The context is Psalm 41 verse nine, quote, even my bosom friend in whom I trusted who ate of my bread has lifted his heel against me. Not this fake guy showed that he was fake to begin with. No, my bosom friend. Like, not my, un, like, not that I never knew this guy. Like, he was my friend. No, he was chosen by me. He was casting out unclean spirits, telling people to repent, healing them with oil. Um, following him around everywhere he went. Uh, he, he calls him his friend. Um, and then, you know, Peter and the apostles recognize that in Acts chapter 1, when they choose another disciple to replace him, like Judas, who was in this ministry with us, sadly failed. It wasn't that he was never in the ministry or that he never was like a friend of Jesus. So I, I think... Uh, you can't really say that like someone never was into it. I'd say you have to say that maybe they were into it, not as intensely as you might've been, but they were into it. Like they were friends with God, like they were praying, they were you know, trying, but it's kind of like that parable uh, that Jesus gives of um, like the sower and the seed, about some seed like falls on the ground, but then some of you know, it is choked out by, the weeds, uh, some of it's choked out by the vines. Um, some of the seed falls on you know, rocky ground and it starts off great, but then it dies off. You can falter, but that's the, again, the beautiful thing if you can always come right back. And Jesus always offers that forgiveness and you boom, you're right back. So, but that's not to say that some people like could legitimately be a fake Christian. Uh, like that is certainly a possibility uh, somebody could be, uh, you know, just kind of playing around with it or like uh, just trying to be in with the club, but not actually like a friend of Jesus. But they, uh, you know, they, I don't know, maybe somebody who like goes to youth group or uh, like just goes to mass on Sundays because their wife makes them <laughs> something like that. Like you're not, your heart hasn't actually been changed. Um, you're not actually trying. You're not actually like one of the, not really a disciple. You just, some of that's kind of going along with the flow, but and not, your heart hasn't really been changed in that. Um, I think there's a lot of people that end up um, getting baptized and then confirmed in the Catholic faith. And then they, they end up losing that faith. And maybe they never, like maybe they never really had much faith to begin with. They just went to mass solely for the purpose of, you know, being there. They solely they solely went to mass for, like parents made them, and the whole thing was, like, they were just made to do it. They weren't a, uh, they had no interest in there. So like they they would have gotten the graces of the sacraments. They would have like, been changed by God, but they like rejected that so quickly, or they never re- maybe they didn't have the intention to get those graces so like they've been maybe got the mark on their head that they're gods but their heart was never changed because they never had the intention of getting it i think that that is a possibility but you can't say that like every single person you know like any person that falls away or any person that commits a serious sin was never christian to begin with like the example of judas very clearly like my bosom friend whom i trusted Eight of my bread. He did this. Yeah. Uh, 
So I, I've got one final question before I ask you to uh, share some of your closing thoughts on eternal security as a whole. Uh, and, and the closing question is this. So as a former Protestant, uh, I, I was with the Assemblies of God and uh, I was never taught one saved, always saved. It was more of a sola fide, but you could lose your salvation. But this does resonate with me in, uh, in this regard. Because we've established from scripture that one saved, always saved is not a biblical doctrine. What's concerning then is to swing to the other extreme is to become very Pelagian in that I have to work at my salvation. And this is something I can work and earn. And if I don't, I'm going to hell. So it, it almost, I, I remember coming into the church and, and finding so much hope and assurance in the Catholic Church's uh, teachings as found in sacred scripture. But there are areas that me, as well as a lot of people, do struggle with, like, where do we draw the line from? Uh, this is a work of God that we're cooperating with versus I can work all of this out, this, this almost entirely Pelagian concept of let me earn my salvation. Because if one saved, always saved isn't a doctrine, then the other extreme is then I, it's entirely dependent on my work. So what would be your, your answer or your counsel to, to people who fear the swing to that other extreme? Yeah, I would say if you like have faith in God and like have a genuine like repentance to him and you, you know, get baptized or you immerse yourself in Christ's passion and are restored and reconciled with God, that was, that was not you. That was, that was God. Like the whole reason somebody's heart would have been changed was God. You know? um, and so you know, no matter how much you try to explain something to somebody to change their heart, like it's only God that can really make the light go on, you know, and like give them that grace. Um, so that right there wasn't you. And then getting baptized, that's an action, but it's really, it's a, that's an action of God. Like that's not you doing it. That's God doing that to you. That's why it, specifically it's a priest that does it to you. That's why you can't baptize yourself. <laughs> you know, it's uh, like God cooperating for you through a priest and, so God is baptizing you. He's the one who's you know, putting you under water and he's the one who's transforming your heart. And so like your heart is transformed right there. So that had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with God. It had everything to do with Jesus's uh, reconciling death. You, place of you. Um, so like once you're in, like once you become like his body on earth, like, First, I was living Luke's life, and then, boom, now I'm living Christ's life. You know, like, you, first you were living, like, a, an ordinary life, but then, like, your life has changed, and your heart has changed, and so you just, you think differently, and you speak differently, and you act differently. Like, of course, that's a that's a constant prog progressive thing. Um, we have that image of Jeremiah of, uh, I think it's Jeremiah 17 or Jeremiah 18, where uh, you have the image of the potter and the clay of, like, that's not you doing that. That's God doing that. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> like the, the pot can't be the potter at the same time. Like, you know, um, so you have like, God's the one who's making that masterpiece and like that workmanship. Like I think of St. Joseph working on some kind of table or like, like he's making a workmanship. He's making something look great. Like sanding it down and then putting this piece and that piece and then painting it and making it look great. Like that's like, how we all start out like we're it was all god's work and it ends as god's work like god's the one who's doing that um but in order for god to work he has to tell us to do stuff because we still have free will so we're, we're still uh thinking okay like god changed me but now he wants me to go and love my neighbor and like how do i do that exactly so you have to be like putting forth effort to ask god like how do i serve you and where do i need to serve you today and he'll tell you where to go and what to do, or what to say, or what to think. Um, and so like you, you do that. That was like all you simply like, remember that passage where Jesus says, uh, he gives that parable of the servant and says, um, we're simple servants that we just did what we were told. I thought that was such a, like a, a humble mindset there of like, 
you did do what you were told, so you were responsible for doing what you told what you what you're told to do, but like that wasn't you, that was the person that told you to do it. Like it all the emphasis is on him and you're simply just the yeah. guy that like I was just doing what I was told. Yeah. Yeah, that's like that humble mindset of God's the one who's doing this and the emphasis is on him, not on yourself. So you have to do that as well. That's a the humble mindset and you have to ask him to do that because you need his grace to do it. So like it, it is like a a sense of um like you earn rewards in heaven. Um, but heaven was a a gift to you because you he changed your heart. So that's like now your gift. Um, it gives you that gift and you just have to hold on to that gift and cooperate with him, that God working together with us, being a coworker. So you're holding on to the gift with him. Um, so like you're maintaining and keeping that friendship going. Um, but it's really him that's like doing that. He's the one who's molding you and he's the one who's empowering you and you know, giving you the, the food, shelter and clothing to do what you need to do. And so like, if you have the mindset though, of like all those things came from you, then you'd have a very like working mindset of like, I'm just like, a, <laughs> like I'm earning my way to heaven. Um, but if you have that humble mindset of what Jesus said, of like, I'm just a guy, somebody did what we were told. You know, God's the one who changed me. And I get, you know, I get that gift because he gave it to me. Um, you have to cooperate with him, but the emphasis is on him. Yeah, and, and that, that puts all of this into a very sound perspective. So uh, this is Marcus Peter, president of the St. Peter Institute for Scripture and Evangelization. And I've been talking this morning with uh, Luke Lancaster, the director of biblical apologetics for the Institute. Uh, feel free to hit us up with comments, more questions on one saved, always saved, or eternal security as a doctrine. Uh, I know Luke, I personally know Luke would be more than happy to engage any question you might have. And feel free to get in touch with us if you have any other topics you'd like for us to address and, and talk about, whether apologetics, evangelization, biblical theology as a whole. Uh, until next time, God bless you and keep you.